Good evening. We're glad you're with us tonight. For those that are in the building, you look absolutely smashing, darling, smashing. You look marvelous. Uh, for those online, I have no idea what you look like, but we're glad you're out there. You could be in your pajamas, and I don't blame you because it's hot, but we are glad you're with us tonight. Ha! ha. The, the Bigfoot with the ha in the background. So, uh... Special thanks to uh, Miss Wendy and Miss Becca tonight for doing the heartbeat. Uh, Yeah, and uh, yeah. Uh, I got tied up a little bit and did not get to hear all of it. So is Miss Becca going to, if we get done early, and we will, she's going to do about five minutes at the end for us. Some things God showed her, and I want you all to hear that if you didn't get to. Uh, I love it when, when... your kids, when you hear God working through your children, it's exciting to hear that. And so, um, especially when it's something that you know is a passion of mine and a passion of yours, the book of Jonah. So it's exciting. Uh, If you don't, if you weren't here for it, we studied the book of Jonah. The four chapters took us about four months to get through. Uh, I have done countless, countless years on Jonah. He's one of my favorites. But anyway, uh, Acts chapter 20 tonight, Acts chapter 20, uh, there's probably a lot more meat on the bone than we're going to chew on. Uh, we're just going to say we got a bad tooth and not chew on all the meat tonight, but um, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started. Father, I thank you tonight for who you are. I thank you for the new parking lot out there. Uh, I thank you for the stripes on it, even though the ones I put on are not exactly straight, but I thank you that... We survived the heat and got them on there, Lord. We thank you that you are amazing and wonderful and that you love us even when we are not sure we deserve to be loved. God, I pray for those that are sick and in need, those that need a touch from you. Uh, Lord, we pray that you minister tonight through us, that your word would be brought forth, not us, but your word. We give you honor today. We give you praise in your precious and holy name. Amen, amen, and amen. All right, so you, as, if you remember two weeks ago, there was rioting in Ephesus, and they were trying to, to kill Paul, and one of them stood up and said, okay, stop, 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 it's not going to benefit anybody, kind of got them to, to hush a little bit, and Acts chapter 20 picks up right there, verse 1, I don't have a handout tonight, by the way, so you have no homework, somebody say, yay, yay, yay. next week you'll have two, so... Uh, and after the uproar, oh, by the way, Sunday morning's going to be a little different. Miss Kathy, you didn't know this yet, probably, but you do now. So Sunday morning, Miss Bab never gets to be in church with us. So we're, we're going to get people, we're going to start doing a few things differently occasionally. Sunday morning, Miss Bab is going to do children's church in here for about five or six minutes. So after offering, she's going to come up and do a children's church lesson, bring all the kids up and do the children's church lesson. And then the kids are going to have a handout, and they have to, to uh, try to keep up with me and figure out how many times I said this or did that, what color shoes I'm wearing, how many, what scripture I used, and they're going to have a handout to fill out. And then they get to go in the back and get all the candy that she would normally feed them before you take them home to eat on the way home so they'll be more wired for you when you get them home. But that way, Miss Bev will get to be in church with us. Somebody say yay. 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 Miss Bev needs church too. Uh, so, uh, but don't miss Sunday. I think there's something 
for everyone this Sunday. I'm going to use some object lessons. Unless God changes it, uh, I believe it's going to be something for everyone. Acts chapter 20, verse 1. And after the uproar was ceased, God, I don't know when that will happen, but sometime in the near future. Ha! <laughs> Paul called unto his disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. The writing in Ephesus convinced Paul it was time to go. Um, Paul was a hugger, right? Paul was a hugger. How many met Jeff? Jeff is a hugger. This is the way Jeff says hello, right? And Jeff's a big guy. And Jeff starts with one arm up here and one here because he's coming in like with a, uh, an airplane tilting to get to the runway bear hug and uh, my kind of guy. But Paul was a hugger. It said, after and embraced them and departed to go into Macedonia. Verse 2, when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail into Syria, he pur uh, purposed to return through Macedonia. And there accompanied him into Asia, Sopatar uh, of Berea, and of Thessalonica, uh, Articus of Secondus, and Secondus. Gets, they put his name in there second, right? So he seconded us. And uh, Gaius of Derby, I have no idea how to pronounce these. And Timotheus, he was probably one of these guys' relative. And of Asia, Tychius and Trophimus, these going before tarried for us at Troas. Uh, Paul was always trying to go back and encourage the churches to keep going. Uh, he went to Greece and stayed three months. How many know that people need to be encouraged, right? Usually, they need to be encouraged when they're fired up Sunday morning leaving here. It's usually around 2 o'clock in the afternoon before they actually need someone to help fire them up. They're usually good for the first couple of hours, right? But Paul was always trying to go back and fire them up. He went to Greece and he stayed three months. And when the religious crowd plotted to get him... Says the Jews, I hate it, but that's actually what happened. The religious crowd plotted to get him. He changed his course, and instead of going by sea the whole way, he took a more inland route, visiting as he went. Now, we won't get into this deep, but, but I would say this to you. Many times in ministry, whether that be your personal ministry or ministry out there, we're always looking for the devil to get us, and most of the time it's not the devil that's after us. It's ministry that's after us. And it doesn't take very long for the devil to get in good people's ears and stir up problems among people. How can I prove that? Joel Osteen preaches Christ and him crucified, but there's more people trying to crucify Joel Osteen than they are Satan. Straight up truth. And if you ever met Joel Osteen's daddy, that man was as fireball Pentecostal Holy Ghost filled. His mom got healed from cancer without a doctor. And she was eat up with it. And if you ever listen to one of his entire sermons, he always shares Jesus at the very end. You may not like him because he preaches a little bit of prosperity, but hey, if you're a born again child of God, you ought to have a little bit of prosperity in your life somewhere along the way. God never said, and I will give you life, and it will suck. <laughs> Whoa, did I say that? He actually said, I'll give you life, and it'll be life more abundantly. Maybe it's the way you look at it instead of other things. But there's always an attack on people. Well, I don't like them because they're Pentecostal. I don't like them because I don't like them. Usually it's the religious crowd that's out to get you. Because he wore overalls tonight. It's the most comfortable thing I own. And it's 7,942 degrees out there. And I've been out there since 745 this morning. Except for that 20 minute window when... <laughs> Moving along. He had traveling companions. Sopatar... Aristocrat, Secondus, Gaius, Timotheus, Trophimus, 
And then he went back to Troas. Anybody know where that is today? That's modern day Turkey. That's modern day Turkey. With some gravy and dressing, right? Oh, got to have some dressing. Verse 6. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas, Troas, however you want to pronounce it, in five days where we abode seven days. It's uh, neat to me that they give you time frames in here and we could go in and break those down, but, but hey, that leaves you something to do. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, what day is the first day of the week? Sunday, they came together to break bread. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in the window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, if you look this up in the in the uh, Greek or in the Strong's, there's an asterisk by the word long. It just means extremely long. A word not translated, but it means this boy was preaching. He was a long-winded preacher. He sunk down, Eutychus, with sleep and fell down from the third loft or the third floor and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, there's Paul the hugger again, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. Sunday morning, the disciples come together to break bread. Sunday morning, the disciples come together to break bread and fellowship. How many know we need fellowship? For those of you online, I know it's comfortable sitting at home. I know that. Gosh, it would be nice tonight to sit at home. But we need each other. We need this. We need this. In fact, there's a reason that it says in the scripture, forsake not the assembling of the saints. We're stronger when we're together. We need each other. Uh, Eutychus fell asleep, a deep sleep. Uh, Just for the sake of argument. How many think that was because Paul preached too long? Come on, be honest, Nelson. Yeah, Uh, It was midnight, and they got together that morning, right? I mean, we're 12 hours, and Paul's about to preach all night till morning again. I'm proud of his lung capacity, to be honest with you. but, But maybe it was the oil lamp fumes. It said there was a lot of oil lamps, right? So maybe the fumes knocked him out. Maybe, maybe, maybe it was the kerosene. I don't know. It could have been. Uh, maybe he was just tired from the day's events. Food coma. Food coma, maybe. Ate too much bread, yeah. Maybe the turkey got him. Who knows? Uh, yeah, whatever it was in in the turkey. I don't know. And maybe he was just like us and gets sleepy about three in the afternoon. Uh, but he fell asleep into a deep sleep and he fell out the third story window. Now, Paul either had great faith here or supernatural faith that the boy would live. The scripture tells us, and I looked it up to make sure, that he was necros, dead. His soul departed dead. Okay? Because I know there's some out there, theologians, that go, well, he just was knocked out. He was, Paul said his life was in him. Scripture says he was dead. Now, you can argue with Scripture if you want, but the Greek word is nekros. It means he was dead. So, Paul goes down, and he jumps on the boy and hugs him, right? Because Paul's a hugger. That was what Jeff would do. Oh, look at that guy. Ah! Uh, And Paul says, hey, there's still life. We got this. Let's go eat. Now, if that's your kid, are you happy with Paul right now? Because the kid's still there. They go back upstairs to eat. Because it tells us later that they, after they had brought him up, the kid, Paul goes back up and continues preaching. Now, I got to tell you, I have preached a service where a guy had a heart attack. We stopped service. I didn't finish. 
we, we stop service and call an ambulance, right? I probably don't have the faith of Paul. I should have hugged the guy, Jeff, and kept on preaching, I guess. But Paul hugs him and says, ah, his life's still in him. Let's do this thing, right? I don't know if that's supernatural faith. I don't know if he didn't like the boy's mama. I don't know what it was, but give me some thoughts here on that. Just Eutychus is dead downstairs. Paul says he'll be all right. <laughs> and he goes back upstairs to eat. Okay, Paul was under the spirit. I'll agree with that. I'll agree with that. But if you're the mom, right? Okay, hang on one sec. Go. He had a point to make, and it didn't matter if it was 17 hours later. He's going to preach till the point's done. Everybody may fall asleep and fall out a window, but he's going to keep preaching. Uh, and they were. They were not happy. You're right. Uh, they shouldn't be happy, I guess. I don't know. Um, I did have a guy preach for me one time, a, a kid in school, a student. And he came and said, boy, this church is on fire. I should have preached this message, but I won't. And he threw that one. And he threw another one. And he threw another one. And he said, but I'm going to preach this one. Two and a half hours later, my head was laid back on the pew. I raised up and I looked around. There was like four people left. And he was still going wide open. And I'm like, I'm the pastor. I have to stay, right? Because, I mean, the spirit left an hour and a half ago. It's good kid. Good kid, though. Good kid. Just wound up. I don't think he'd ever preached in front of 20 people before. But anyway, so Eutychus got up. He was fine. But, man, that's faith right there, isn't it? To go back to dinner when the guy's dead. Oh, he'd be all right. It's good faith. Let me move right along. Verse 13. And we went before to ship and sailed unto Asso, there intending to take in Paul, for so he had appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Asso, we took him in and came to Midilene. <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, and we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chloe, <laughs> to Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried unto, does anybody want to try that one? What? Yeah, you're ahead of me. Troglodyte. Troglodyte. Yeah. And the next day we got to Miletus. How about that? Verse 16, for Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Paul planned on walking alone. Some of the disciples took him on the ship and then part of the way Paul wanted to stop at Ephesus, but wanted to be in Jerusalem for Pentecost. So he skipped the stop at Ephesus. I believe, I might be wrong, but I believe Paul knew that if he went there, he would stay too long. Because his heart and his passion was to help them. Ephesus was the church that he was birthed out of, if you will. And I think Paul knew if he went there, he would stay too long and he would miss Jerusalem and Pentecost. And so Paul intentionally was going to walk the other direction to go around. He was going to skip going to Ephesus. And one of the reasons we'll get to in a minute is because the message he had for the Ephesians. But I think sometimes in ministry, our heart gets in the way of, of what's good common sense. Okay? And I say that with absolute love, but I think sometimes our heart gets in the way of good common sense. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. Sometimes when we ought to be taking a break, we're doing something for somebody. Sometimes we're helping somebody that we know we really should be backing off. Sometimes we literally 
or enabling people that we should be stepping back and not enabling. We've got to be careful to listen to the Spirit of God and know when to say when. Now, I'm the, you, Miss Irma, you know I'm talking to you too, honey. I love you and you're my, you're my elder, but I'm talking to you too. The truth is, sometimes we have to say no. Sometimes we have to literally say no. And sometimes we need to make sure that what we do is led by the Spirit. And I think Paul, being led by the Spirit, had so much desire that he knew if he went there, he would stay too long. And so he intentionally skipped. But he did call for the elders of Ephesus to come and see him. Verse 18. Before we go there, let me say this to you. Pray before you make yes answers to everything. Don't be a jerk and say no to everything. But under the same token, be careful. Because I have 300 things a day that I could do. And desire to do. But I have to choose to not always do them. And sometimes that's hard for me because I enjoy helping everybody. And sometimes I just simply can't do it all. And if I do do it all, it kills me. So, verse 18. When they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befall me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Save that the Holy Ghost, preached on this scripture not long ago, save that the Holy Ghost witness in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. If there's the biggest amount of meat on the bone in this scripture, I believe it's in this text right here. And I'll explain that to you. You may already catch it, but I'll explain it. Paul tends to evangelize everywhere he goes, but all of a sudden, Paul's pastor's heart shows up. There is a difference in being an evangelist and being a pastor. Uh, I was an evangelist for many years, and I still want to see souls saved as a pastor. But my heart is different. When God shifted my ministry, my heart changed. Pastoring, you want to mentor people. And Paul's mentoring the Ephesians here. And he tells them, I've been an example of Jesus since day one. Don't look at me. Don't look at my accomplishments. Look at my accomplishments as me following Christ testifying from house to house to Greeks and Jews. And then he said, Now I go by the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing what's going to happen when I get there, but knowing I must go. Chains and tribulations await me everywhere I go. This is testified by the Holy Spirit. But I do not count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race. He often spoke in sports terms. It was something they related to. Then he goes on to say, I have not stopped from sharing the whole counsel of God to you. He actually mentions it twice in this text. I am innocent of the blood of man because I have shared the truth. What a powerful statement Paul makes here. I want you to hear this. 
This is what Paul said. I am not held accountable because I have shared the fullness of the gospel with you. In other words, here's what he said. If my words have offended you, but I've told you the truth, so be it. Because I will not sugarcoat or candy coat God's word to where you feel good about yourself and you didn't know the truth of God. He said, since day one, I have told you the truth. It has been my testimony. I can't tell you the people I've offended sitting in my office and my wife. You've been with my wife a few times as she probably offended you a time or two. Not yet. She can be blunt. But you know why? Because I know I've offended Miss Kathy a time or two. <laughs> She's smiling back there. I'm not even going to look up again. But um, the simple truth is this. If I get up here and make you feel good and we fill the pews and we fill the coffers and, and we do everything on planet earth, but I didn't tell you the complete truth of God then I'm held accountable for that. Your blood is on my hands because I never told you the fullness. And Paul said, I am innocent of the blood of the men and women in the areas I've been because I have told them the truth. And he breaks it down a little bit more. And this is where I think the meat comes to. Something we don't talk about often enough, in my opinion. We love little quotes like uh, St. Augustine. Preach the gospel everywhere you go. Use words if necessary. That's a good quote, isn't it? Not really. Paul said, let my deeds show, but I'm going to use my words anyway. If all your neighbors saw was that you did good things and they never heard you share the gospel of Jesus Christ and they split hell wide open, you're going to be held accountable for not sharing with them. Because it's not our responsibility to use words if necessary. Paul said words are necessary. We have 66 books of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 66 books of words. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14 of John chapter 1, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We have 66 books of Jesus, the Word, Logos. The Word. So I would caution you. I would caution you to share with your friends and family. To share with your friends and family. And if it offends them, so be it. Don't do it in an offensive manner, but share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good and the bad. And if you're Clint Eastwood, share the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right? Because living in front of them might not be enough. When he has placed in you words that you can share. And Paul literally says, I will not be held accountable. While they may have chased me out of every town I've ever been in, and the Holy Spirit has confirmed that everywhere I go, I'm going to have troubles. I'm not going to have troubles because I did not share the gospel. I will have troubles because I shared Jesus. He actually says from day one. Food for thought there. Verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. He tells them to make sure you feed those who God has placed under you. 
It's a big nugget, guys. That means your children. That means your friends. Oh, no, he's just talking to the preachers. Mm, be careful. It's easy to pass the buck. God gave you a circle of influence I'll never reach. God gave you people I'll never reach. Put them in your life, not mine. Put them in your life. And he said, I'm going to give you the opportunity to feed them, to share with them, to open up to them. And Paul said, listen to what he said, take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. And to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. What is an overseer? It's someone that looks over the folks that are around them or under them or however you want to put it. That's your friends and your family, guys, your co-workers. By the grace of God, I'll never work where you work, Tim. Or Tim. Or Tim. Third Tim. Although I might be able to work where you work, third Tim, uh, working on boats. But uh, you will have opportunities to share Jesus that I'll never have. Use them wisely. Move on. Verse 29. For I know this. That after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Who did he say they wouldn't spare? He didn't say the elders, did he? He didn't say the leaders, did he? The sheep. The ones under us. The ones that we have care over. That's the ones they're out to get. Whose responsibility are they? Ours. Verse 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. We'll talk about that in a minute. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. For three years I've warned you with compassion and with a broken heart, with tears, night and day. I got a question written in here in my notes. You don't have to answer it, but it'd be awesome if somebody did. I wonder if we need a few more broken-hearted saints for the lost and dying world. I wonder if we need a few more men and women of God who weep day and night for a lost and dying world around them. As I was painting today, Jim, out here in the parking lot making wavy lines where there should have been straight ones. One of your buddies drove by in a convertible. That's probably all you need to know to know who it was. He blew his horn and he waved at me. And after having gone, just freshly gone over this scripture, I thought in my heart, man, Need to reach that guy. Need to make sure. Need to make sure that he knows. Not just hope. Make sure that he knows. He's a good guy. As good a guy as you'll meet. But does he know Jesus as his Lord and Savior? Is there, a, without a doubt, is he born again child of God? Has he been told the clear? And I'm sure you have. I'm sure you've made it very clear to him the difference in being a good person. And, but has there been a change? Are we heartbroken over a lost and dying world? And if not, what do we do to get there? 
Moving on. Smile. Come on. It's almost done. Uh, I have, see, I told you there was some meat on this bone. Unfortunately, it's not the meat you want to hear, right? We laughed up till now, but now here we are in the hard stuff. Uh, but this is how the church started, brokenhearted for a lost and dying world. If we're going to see God move, this is how we need to be now, brokenhearted for a lost and dying world. Paul says, for three years, I've wept over you. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel, yet ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I didn't do it for money. I didn't do it for money. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know a pastor that works for a paycheck. Most of us get one, but that's not what we work for. I have showed you all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul tells them, take care of each other. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Good words to live by. He shared deed and word with them. Verse 36. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto his ship. And we're going to close with this thought and then let Miss Becca come, but I want to close with this thought. One of the greatest things that I have is love from you guys. I, I, I mean that. I, I mean that with everything in me. A, a pastor that is loved by his people, you guys stepped up Sunday and took care of, of the bishop. Uh, I'll share more about him next week, but uh, I can't at liberty share more today, but I will next week. Um, but y'all took care of him. And all I did was said, hey guys, take care of my buddy. He's my friend. And y'all stepped up, took good care of him, great care of him. Nothing I've asked of this church have they not come up with, except maybe manual labor sometimes. But... Uh, I feel loved. I always have since day one. And it's the greatest thing on planet earth. But Paul said, don't follow me and my accomplishments. Follow Christ. And I have always tried to make sure you knew that it wasn't about me. And one of the things that scares, I guess, pardon my expression, but scares the hell out of me is that people get caught up in me being your pastor more than him being your king. Well, I don't know what I'd do if you weren't the pastor. Well, you would move on and be doing exactly what he called you to do. Because it isn't about me, it's about him. Period. Now, unless something changes, you're stuck with me for a long time to come. I've turned down every opportunity that's come my way. Because this is where God wants me. And to be honest, it's where I want to be. Because I love you and I hope most of you love me. But they said the worst thing that they were sorrowful for wasn't the lost people around them. It wasn't that people were going to come in and try to destroy. It was that they weren't going to see Paul anymore. That's what they were more worried about than anything else. Now, maybe I take that too far, but that bothers me. We should be more concerned about a lost and dying world. And once again, I'm tickled that most of you like me. Yeah, you love me. I don't know if you like me, but you love me, right? 
Oh, because God said you had to. But at the end of the day, don't put me on a pedestal. Don't grade me, you'll fail. You will fail your test if you are judging by me. You're going to flunk out. That is a guarantee. You don't win by following Mark. Period. If you see me get one right, it's because he had grace and mercy on me. Period. Follow him. And if he put me up here as your shepherd, then let me lead you. But by all means, make sure I'm leading you to him and not me. Because when it, I see things like this in Scripture, the worst thing they were worried about, the most sorrow they had, and maybe I'm reading too much into it. They were more worried about not seeing Paul any more than anything else. He just told them people were going to come in and destroy the church. And they're worried that he's going to be gone. Ought not be that way. Make sure we keep the main thing. The main thing. And that's Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Comments or questions? I stress over things like that when people say, Pastor, I love you. I love you too. But remember, it's God's the most important one, right? All right, yeah, okay. All right, make sure. Yes. Yeah. You don't get that way with a casual Christian life. Uh, some of the modern day men of that time, uh, some of the stories are, uh, when people come in to train under him, they came in with a Bible under one hand and a newspaper under the other. And he said, the Bible's welcome, the newspaper's not, uh, because we don't have time for that. Um, because the truth is, if I invest six hours of my day on social media or, or TV or whatever it is, then it's going to be hard to walk in that type of anointing. Paul literally invested in his time with God and the Holy Spirit. And I do think that there are times that are more anointed in the earth than other times. But I also believe at any given time, any of us could be that anointed. Any of us. But it doesn't come without a cost. He said the Holy Spirit confirms that everywhere I go, I'm going to take a beating. Roughly. You know, you're not going to have friends in every corner you will, but you're going to have enemies in every corner too. So, um, I can tell you every time I've been super anointed in my life, I've had super opposition. Every time that this church gets to a point of explosion, the opposition comes tremendously against it. So, um, you, you, yes. You could literally walk in a point where you would know how to pray for every person without them opening their mouth. Yeah, it's there. He, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We just have to get our focus to that. Anybody else? Question? Tumbleweeds? Tim, you just look like you want to say something. I was talking to the other two. Uh, all right. Miss Becky, you ready?